Dabble, dabble, toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. Throw in, throw in, eagles busters. But with, but with tropes, Japanese. Independent American. With all her strength and all her beauty. Workaholic with all her greed. And her smarts are so Japanese. And a young man all about tail. A ghost girly so very proper. Many extras, rivals and schemes. Double, double, toil and trouble. Fire burn and cauldron bubble. <laughs> Super Mikami is a series swimming in the 80s, since it's clear inspiration. So if you've got a little mess around your house, get yourself a Black & Decker Dustbuster. Through character designs and not forgetting a few references. Somewhere in Japan, where Reapers are in the same level as... Uh, whatever his name is, Riko Mikami works as a ghost sweeper, using many amulets, stones and items to entrap spirits of evil that don't work in pyramids. At a first glance, ghost sweeper can look like just the Japanese version of Ghostbusters, but that's pretty much it. Like the last series we saw here, Gunbuster, it uses its American influences exploring them well. However, unlike the unusual mix of tennis and jets, GS uses ghost and Japanese mythology for comedy in a way quite similar to the original, which is probably the best choice here. Say what you will of, perhaps, Tarantino, two things are undeniable. One, his work is derivative, that is, explores something started by others. And two, he knows it and makes sure to use what he has learned. In fact, I'd argue that's the reason why his work has punch. That was getting annoying really fast, wasn't it? So we have Japanese tropes dressed as Americans from the 80s. Woman who only cares about money. Big breasted, hair back, high heels and tube top dress. Loser with no money who thinks only about sex and women. Wearing jean jackets and pants and a bandana. No, he doesn't have a band. And a gifted woman always ready to help, please and do the housework. If she had been married to someone, he could have been elected more easily. I don't know if that was the intention, it certainly wasn't to show that Brazilian journalism 20 years later would be dead, but considering the always mentioned paradox of the country of the future with millenary traditions, I have to point out to the person who would be considered perfect centuries ago following every cultural tradition to the point of being a willing sacrifice to a mountain god is quite literally dead. On the other hand, the guy who adopts occidentalism completely wants women, fame and money but never gets a relationship, recognition or a decent salary. In fact, in maybe his only victory, after many problems and screams from the ghost hell he gets a raise. Yokoshima-kun! GQ-255円でよけりゃ戻ってらっしゃい. Hi! Yep, I'd say he's paid in peanuts, but I doubt he could afford a single bag. The dude literally had to eat half a pack of noodles. The series itself is very episodic, following many common formulas. Episodes present a problem to solve and focus in one character many times taking away other characters' skills or simply ignoring them so the focused one can do what it's going to do. In episodes where characters are introduced, as they are the focus, they are stronger and more threatening. Real threats, though, are completely beaten in one or two episodes. For instance, episode 7 introduced Dr. Faust, which in this universe is an immortal alchemist who created a living machine. His assistant Maria is a flying super strong robot and is more a direct threat, but his machineries and potions knowledge would still make him very dangerous. After two episodes, he is the butt of third age and poverty jokes, only becoming dangerous when really necessary but almost never being able to do anything. That is one of the bigger problems, the lack of continuity. Although characters return, it's as if nothing happened, unless it's absolutely necessary to mention it. 
なんであんたがカラス先生のこと知ってんの For instance, in two episodes, Mikami tries to increase her powers, indicating that maybe things are going to get more serious from then on. They don't. After those two episodes, you don't see anything particularly impossible before them. She doesn't get a bazooka or a giant robot box. She doesn't even get a Paku Y thingy. Still, that doesn't mean it isn't fun. When it follows more of the Ghostbuster line of story or expands on the characters, the episodes are well developed. <laughs> Occasionally, they depend too much on a joke or a trope, like, for instance, showing the main character in a bathing suit. The stories of these episodes aren't bad, but I can't deny that when I saw Mikami laying on the beach for the second time, which isn't exactly the same, not at all, how could you? It did break the suspension of disbelief a bit. However, Ghost Sweeper knows where its appeal is, having stories with mythology but not being simply a myth after another to be defeated. Even when it's a matter of defeating something, it isn't simply finding the problem and using the proton string, something the original would never do. Extreme Ghostbusters, we ain't afraid of no ghosts. Since it is very episodic, it would be better to watch the episodes instead of having them commented extensively, so I'll just comment a few notable moments. In episode 13, Reiko's assistant, Yokoshima, who only works for her because he's a horn dog, is hired by her cursed using rival. The better pay, however, has a cost. <laughs> <laughs> then she forces him to sacrifice part of his life to attack Reiko using his horniness as a part of a curse. <laughs> And he can't refuse because his contract is guaranteed by the God of Contracts. Two episodes later, the recurring characters are brought together to help Reiko's master, Father Karasu, defeat one of the most powerful supernatural beings, Count Barto. A vampire who's trying to take over the world, starting by an island in Italy. The matter is resolved by a plot device that says that the vampire who bites another becomes its master. At the same time, this is an interesting way of making the characters go against each other without losing their personalities. But not only the last fight depends completely on the one single character who can take part in it, the victory isn't even shown. We just know he won because the vampire stopped attacking. And who is this character? Father Karas' assistant, a half-vampire who, by the end of the story, would be controlling every single vampire in the region. On that note, not only is it forced, what happens if he keeps using his power? If he wants, he can continue making vampires out of the world, forcing people to cooperate, since no one can deny orders from the vampire in control. Now this is me taking over the world with smiles. He can basically be Napoleon without wars. But no, let's forget he's a vampire master forever and make him the rival's love interest. Vampire Shoryuken! Ha! Given the similarity with Gumbuster in its origin, I have to mention episode 20, in which Father Karasu has to exorcise the Yurei of a girl who was trying to be a Wimbledon star, and trained so much her swing was compared to an elephant. <laughs> But the war stopped her plans. Her resentment is too strong for her to be exorcised normally, so she has to be beaten in a tennis bat so her spirit is satisfied. Other than that, we have an episode in which Yokoshima finally finds a girl who would like to be with him. Who is actually a mermaid, and first seems to actually want to date him, but afterwards seems to just want him to get back at her triton husband for leaving her for a fune yure. The husband comes back for the Fune Yurei having forced him to attack humans and him not wanting to do that anymore. Now I personally didn't like this because it's that old Japanese trope of the husband who leaves the wife and is just taken back for no reason. But she's a woman who left her tadpoles for days and was tricking a man. He is the worthless husband who deserves no respect and the lover just attacks humans every day. Nobody here is worth anything. Also, we have a cursed Muramasa sword that follows bad feelings, which gives us one of the funniest sequences in the series, in which the rival's assistants try to direct the sword where they want it to go. <coughs> Yeah,
後のみんなは絶対に真似をしちゃいけないよ And I must note, the enemies can be well developed, like a ghost clown who's better defined than that, I mean it, and a spirit that goes into dreams called nightmare, mare being a female horse. He doesn't say he's a female, but they might be forcing the joke, or it could be something lost in the anime's English. Bye bye, sadness, and find out! Besides all that, we have a ghost train, dragon people, one of which is going to be dressing up as. Trunks, people becoming mannequins, kids stuck in a school in another dimension before corpse party, flying brooms, possession, a new evil robot, and a chocolate golem. The series ends in a more thematically self aware episode in which the characters have to go into a samurai movie and defeat a chaplain spirit. Obviously, being such an episodic series, there was always the possibility of being continued, and maybe the idea was to not close the series completely. And some of these episodes are certainly worth it for your Halloween. After seeing the whole series, I can easily say that I would watch the better ones again. Maybe not everyone, but the better ones, sure, no problem. Who could it be? Wait. Last time, that Tupperware boob woman sent me to limbo. And it's Halloween, it's probably not a good idea to answer. Wait, how did I get out of limbo? Independent American with full strength. Uh, the hand has to come out. You can't struggle to come out. That was a game. Uh. Now, I personally didn't like this because it's that old Japanese. Oh. Don't stop, you camera. You camera. Now, I personally didn't like this because it's that old trope of the husband who leaves the wife and it's taken back just like that. Of course, Trey. And it's taken back just like that, for no reason. But she is a... Blah. Now it's the alarm. After seeing the whole series, I can say that I'd see the... Blah.